All right, I think we're live now. Uh, I'm assuming, assuming everyone can hear us. Um, so I'll start by um, thanking everybody for participating in the Horasis Global Meeting. Um, this one's called Fostering a Shared Humanity, and I especially want to welcome everybody to our session about the trend is your friend. Um, I don't think there's anybody who would argue that we're not in a, in a data-driven world, um, and that data can be one of the major uses of data is to identify future needs. In an ideal world, we'd all have access to the same data, and it would be there would not be any argument or discussion about what the next step should be. Um, but of course, that's not reality. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on trying to to use data to to um, figure out where the trends are. Um, well, I'd start by um, like taking a few seconds to introduce our speakers. Um, let me switch screens here. Oh, that's not coming. That didn't work so well. Um, let me try one more thing. There it is. So here's our session. All right, well, we'll first start by introducing the panelists. I'm Jerry Power. I'm CEO of i3 Systems. I'm also one of the founders of the i3 Consortium, uh, which was found, the company was founded to sort of improve the way we use data um, to make it more leverageable. And the i3 Consortium is actually an organization where companies, different people get together to talk about how a leveraged view of data can be used more effectively to drive the business. Um, why don't we go around the corner, the, the, the table. Um, Clay, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning. Um, great to see everybody. I'm Clay Grubb, the CEO of Grubb Properties. We are a 60-year-old real estate company that was founded primarily building homes in redline neighborhoods for uh, folks that were cut out of the system. And today we are focused on uh, the essential housing space in the multifamily world and build a uh, product uh, under the brand Link Apartments. Um, currently uh, in the process of taking that national uh, in the United States where we built just six floor plans and two of those floor plans reached down to folks making as little as 60% of median income. Okay. Peta? Hi, I'm Peter Marion. I'm uh, the founder of Future Narrative, which is a trend forecasting and futures agency. Um, I've been a trend forecaster for 15 years now and primarily work in consumer goods, fashion, um, products like that. And so really looking at data from multiple sources around um, a person's full holistic experience. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jake Deep. Hey, good morning, everyone. Jack Deep Sahoda. I am VP of Strategic Alliances with NMI. We're an embedded payments provider. Um, we're white label gateway that enables a lot of the brands that you know on the back end for payment processing. I don't think Marana, Mar Marina is with us. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. We did put one slide together um, to sort of talk a little bit. This, sort of frame the, the conversation we're about to have. I mean, and this is actually four different slides um, that talk about, about some bad data trying to do trend analysis. Um, the first in the upper left-hand corner, there's a forecast for the temperature. Um, I, obviously, is, it's wrong because it says in the year 2022, um, the average New York temperature is going to be 200 degrees. And what, what happened was we forecasted the data with the first six months, um, and by not thinking about um, the fact that temperature is cyclical, um, you get weird things coming out of the data. Um, the one underneath it talks about the number of giraffes that have escaped from zoos. This is made-up data. 
Um, but on the surface, if you look at the chart, it looks like the, the porous zoo is actually doing pretty good against, against global trends. Um, but if you really start to look at it and think about what it's showing, it shows that that one zoo accounts for a growing proportion of escaped giraffes. So um, obviously the, the chart and the reality don't line up. Um, on the cheeseburger consumption chart, um, it shows that um, the, the Fulton High School has actually done pretty well um, cutting back on cheeseburger consumption, trying to push a healthy diet, but the numbers are starting to trickle back up, um, which may be an indication of a problem until you start to realize that the data is not well described. Um, and this actually might just be um, one person changed their diet or, or one person graduated from the high school and it changed the, the consumption rate. Um, the one on the bottom right-hand side um, is basically looking at the number of shark attacks on the Jersey Shore and the amount of ice cream sold. And you can see that there's a correlation between the two, which if you wanted to, you might sort of make the assumption or the uh, the leap to assume that therefore sharks must like people who eat ice cream. Um, but in reality, it's it's not causation. Um, it's just it's just independent data that has nothing to do with each other. Um, so that was kind of um, some examples of how you might trend analysis might not quite work. Um, let's see. Let's see if I got us back. Right now we're back to the regular screen. Perfect. So why don't we start by just talking a little bit about maybe among the panelists, um, some applications, some things we've done in our past um, where we've been able to use trend analysis to actually achieve positive outcomes. Um, and I'll just throw that up as an open question. Um, whoever wants to take it first. Nobody? <laughs> I, I can go if you want. Um, so a lot of my work, obviously, I've been working as a trend forecast for a long time. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing recently, like last year, we were able to predict a lot of the behavioral shifts that would take place as a result of the pandemic. Um, and that was really around looking at things like um, joining up a lot of different ideas. And I think that th this is the really important thing at the moment, which is really around joining up different kinds of data to be able to make predictions. So we were able to predict things like the rise of localism and that sort of acceleration of the globalization trend that we've been seeing recently. And um, we were able to predict, obviously, a lot of the rises around di digitization and digital services and things like that. And it all comes down to really understanding the the multiple facets of a person's life because I think that we can look at different kinds of trends particularly the where the area of the world that I work in in terms of consumer trends and things like that and it, it's it's one of those things where you know there are other forms of trend forecasting that are quite linear you know if you don't you know if you have a population growth and you don't invest in more housing then you're going to have a housing problem come you know 20 years time where if you're looking at things that are far more um ethereal and less tangible you do have to look at lots of different things to be able to create those ideas around how we're going to want to live and what we're going to value um in the future when i think that kind of a segue into i mean obviously we track very closely the demographic trends and um you know here in the united states today you know we have more uh, 30 year olds than we ever had in the history of the United States. Uh, but we actually have more 14 year olds than we have 30 year olds. And so you hear a lot about the millennials, but really the pig in the python in the United States is 14 to 30 year olds. Um, and so that sets a lot of trends. And, uh, and as you look, a, a big one obviously is the urbanization of America. And, uh, and so one of the, hesitancies is during COVID, you know, is that trend going to stop? And, um, and there's been a lot of belief that, hey, that trend stopped. People don't want to be in urban areas. Um, but if you look at that demographic, which now is the largest population, uh, they're pretty resilient and they're moving back in very quickly. And so that's a, a trend that this urbanization trend is one that, that we believe is going to continue. 
uh, spike curve. It is just a pause, and then we'll be back. I mean, obviously, uh, older the older baby boomer may be a little bit different, but um, but certainly with that younger generation, we're seeing that trend continue. Yeah, I'll just, I mean, I'll add an anecdote right back in World War II when um, U.S. Air Force had these planes that were being shot down by anti-aircraft gun. They did a project to figure out, like, where they should add more armor to these planes, right? And they've, you know, one of those things was, like, do we put it around the tail of the pipe where there are this number of holes in the per square foot, or should we put it around the engine where there are lesser holes? So sometimes the data that's telling you is the planes that are not coming back are the ones that are we're losing because they get more shots at around the engine and they go down and we never see that data. And what we see is the planes that are coming back. So data tells you like there's also this absence of data, what's not happening in the world that you're not seeing. So in e-commerce, we see a lot of that in abandonment, right? So one puts a lot of stuff in the cart, but they never finish because the hurdle of actually checking out is so high that you never can make a trend around like what's selling or what, you know, what's selling with which end product or card or things like that. So it's just important to sort of understand the data that doesn't really make it to the end. Um, so your, you know, your flight path or where your journey ends um, tells you a lot about where your problem areas are. So it's a lot of work that we do in payments is trying to figure out how do we make that a smooth consumer experience from end to end so that we actually do get completions. Cool. That, that's a good story. Um, for, for me, um, when I was at USC, um, we were trying to understand, better understand the behavior of the IoT market, Internet of Things. Um, and what we did was everybody had different data. They all showed hockey sticks, but all the hockey sticks were different. And we were trying to figure out which one was right. Um, so we ended up doing our own market surveys to sort of come up with a demand analysis. Um, so we did questionnaires. We collected the data. We analyzed it and came up with, with a curve. But the other thing we did is we also did an economic analysis where we looked at sort of the, the component parts the prices um, and what that did. And, and what we found was that while interest was was high and it was following a hockey stick, if you looked at the economic models, the economic models were not responding to what people wanted to pay for the devices. Um, so we found there was a, a discrepancy between the two data. And if you just looked at the demand data, you would have gone away thinking this is a rosy large market. When you look at the economic data, you start seeing that there are um, hurdles that have to be overcome um, to sort of change the way we think about building these networks out of IoT devices. Um, and if you just looked at one chart or the other chart, you would probably not understand the full picture which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and, and even from all the our four examples that we went through, um, in, in all cases, I mean, it wasn't like, here's the obvious answer, let's just go out, do a survey, collect the data, and here's the answer. Um, the data really was, was hidden. The, the, the insight was hidden in the data, and we had to sort of call it out of the process. So um, I don't know. Those are, those are great examples. Um, but I kind of wonder also, sort of to give the uh, the devil its due, um, what are some, some counterexamples or some places um, that you guys have been aware of or involved in where maybe it didn't quite go so smoothly? The, the thing I think about, if it helps, I mean, I think about the pandemic, um, which we're sort of trying to come out of, um, I mean, everybody seems to have, and they were trying to figure out how to respond to the pandemic. Everybody seemed to have a different set of data. So everybody was forecasting, saying, all right, here's what we should do because of our data. And, and I, I'm assuming everybody was a, an honest player and just had different data. So they was driving all these different actions. Because everybody was doing different actions, that means there was not, not consistency in terms of how the rules were being enforced, enforced across borders. So in some cases, the, those cross-border issues where people go between areas where the rules are different, it actually undermined um, some of the response plan. So that's, that's a case where 
um, having data, actually so much data and no agreement on really what it meant was actually detrimental. I think some of the other situations where data hasn't been used well, it's when one data source, people are over optimistic about the value of a particular data source. And so it tends, I tend to see this more and more because we're using more and more big data and more and more predictive analytics. And so, you know, companies, particularly when you're working at sea level, you know, they all want that kind of level of confidence. They want a quantitative number. They want a piece of data that makes them feel confident about the investment decisions that they're going to make and things like that, particularly when you're working around product decisions and things like that. And I think it's like, you know, I think like we've discussed already, it's really around all of that contextual information that comes around that data and making sure that you're making those decisions with sort of the full information rather than sort of just relying on on that sort of um, trend, sort of linear um, big data or predictive analytics that might come through just because often, you know, that information is it's quite good in, I found in the work that I do, it tends to be good in the sort of six to 12 months sort of range. But when you start to look out into sort of the horizon thinking and further forward, it doesn't really work out so well because, you know, you're looking at things that haven't happened yet. And obviously data predicts, you know, it's evidence of past behavior to predict future experiences or future expectations. And when there's stuff that hasn't yet happened, that's when it becomes quite tricky. And I think, you know, the number of times I've been in situations where someone's asked for a data point on something where there's just not a comparative data point to look back on so that they can make a forward facing decision. It's just like, you know, particularly around tech, actually, I've been working with like a, a mobile phone company and they wanted to understand if, you know, uh, phone usage and sort of the amount of time young people were spending on phones was the same when millennials were younger. But the thing is that there's no like for like comparison there because, you know, the devices weren't as good, they weren't as uh, addictive and all of that sort of stuff. So it's really about kind of understanding that there are limitations to what you can say with the data that you have access to. And I would add, I think it's it's also that you have things happening in your life that may not be in your own domain that set your expectations for what should happen in in that particular domain when you're in industry right so like we we look at uber and what you know the experience of calling a cab getting out of a cab and walking away and never having a payment experience that wouldn't have been predicted that you would be able to do that at a mcdonald's drive through now right so with order ahead pay with an app and walk away, that experience of the Uberization of payments has happened in so many different markets. And if, if you were just looking at fast food as an industry and looking at trends at fast food, you wouldn't have predicted that someday you'd be able to order from an app and just walk away without having pull a card out or giving cash or, or any other way of paying for it. So there's experiences as a consumer is having these experiences in different industries or in different realms. They translate that same expectation in other arenas. And if you're just sort of very siloed and looking at their data or their transaction data in one silo, you may not understand the trend that's coming because of where the technology is going and where the consumer expectation of what that experience is going as well. Well, and I was going to say, even the uh, the trend impact now that when we do get out of a taxi and realize we haven't paid, because <laughs> you're so used to just being taken care of, right. now it's right. like oh, I got I got to pay. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think those are all great examples, and um, you know, I mean, mine obviously my whole world's primarily been housing, so maybe I am too siloed, but. You know, first thing that comes to mind when I ask this question, you know, leading up to the global financial crisis, you know, the trend for sales of condominiums and single family homes could not have been stronger. Um, but the underlying data would have told you that the people weren't there. You had really the baby bust that was at the prime home buying age, and yet we were selling records amount of homes leading into it. And, um, and so, you know, the overlying data looked very strong, but if you look behind the data into the actual trends and who could afford to buy and 
how they were buying, uh, it told a completely different picture, which some people got, but, but very few did. And I think, I mean, if I could just go back to something Jerry said and bring it into sort of housing and residential, right? We did some, um, so my past is in um, doing some innovation architecture and we did some around housing and the expectation, like back in the day, if you're in a multi-housing, you got a, a common key to the door and then you need quarters to go down and pay for the laundromat. And, you know, you never knew if the dryer was available or not available. Now you bring the IoT into it. And from that card access to get into the building where the keys are gone and cards are there to being able to have an app for the building and see how many of those dryers down there in the laundromat are open, how many are in use, how long will the next one will be available. All of that is coming to us with a whole transformational user experience and how building management is working because of IoT, because everything is connected. And that payment experience of dropping quarters has now turned into my card, which is not just an access card into the building, but has an account related to it that has my, you know, all these other payments coming out of. So the expectations are changing. We're looking at our phone to rather than making trips up and down. It may not be trend data in selling properties, but the expectation of that 15-year-old Zen Z person is that everything is connected. Why can't I go on my phone and look at this laundromat? Um, so I think this this transformation again and, and that generation that you're talking about is going to be very different than dropping coins in, in dryers. Well, now, I mean, the, the phone is, is becoming your key. In and out, and uh, you know, especially just the whole transformation of package delivery, you know, grocery delivery, Uber Eat, you know, it's all now electronically delivered into a room with lockers. You know, they put in the code, you get a text, food's been delivered. Here's the combination to grab your food. Right. I think yesterday, after Apple announcing that you'll even have a driver's license on your phone. Um, that really completes like the wall that was been missing in the digital world, right? So, yeah, I mean, my, my daughter goes to NYU Shanghai, and like the whole concept of having a credit card is is now foreign to her. Right. <laughs> it's it's interesting because we started this this chain of conversation with pointing out it, how important it is to understand the context that was used to collect the data. Um, and, and that is like really important. I, I'll be quite honest. I half the time or more than half the time, um, I disregard market research surveys that I see written up in magazine articles because they never describe how they got the data or what the limitations are. So it's really hard to use that. It's, I think it's more for headlines grabbing than anything. Um, but the other thing that came out of this conversation that I think is also interesting is, and this is something I sort of tried to teach students when I was when I was teaching, is that if you do trend analysis, you get the numbers, and that's that's good. Um, but what you you don't really know anything unless you know why the numbers are like they are, because if you understand the the behavior motivations behind what made that curve, um, you better understand how changes to the data might actually affect the curve. Um, the, the the example of the laundromat, I mean, if you people are really looking for a more convenient, let's go down there, I don't want to go back up and down, convenience, well, then obviously anything you can do to make it more convenient is going to sort of further and strengthen that trend, whereas if something comes along that makes a way to do laundry that's even more convenient without laundromats, then maybe that whole thing starts to, to evaporate. Um, but it's you got to understand that behavioral component to it before you really begin to understand the data. Well, I mean, the the one that's that's most revolution revolutionized the apartment industry and the urbanization of it is the TV. You know, it used to be our average one bedroom apartment was 850 square feet, where you had to design for a three foot deep TV in a living room, and in Typically, that changed your whole kitchen, your living room, everything. You know, eventually you had flat screens. And today, you know, everybody just watches on their, their tablet. And so our large one bedroom is 580 square feet. 
And I'll tell you, it's got virtually everything the 850 square foot one ever had, except for room for a TV. You know, one thing one thing I was thinking about was I was getting ready for this session. Um, and I know a lot of companies sort of have started to set up um, specialist functions, um, you know, data analytics groups, which are, are sort of topic specialists that sort of serve the whole company. And I understand why they do it. It's, it's often hard to find um, good data people, data analytics people. Um, but I, I also think about the fact that to really do a good job at data analytics, you really have to understand the data, what's driving it, what's behind it. Um, so if you have a central team that is not embedded in the business unit or, or understands what's going on, they're actually sort of trying to play the game with a handicap. Um, I don't. I don't know whether you guys have experience in both both kinds of organizations, but it's something certainly that I've been thinking about lately. Yeah, I mean, I can add from my time at managing the digital properties for um, Chase for Business, and which was a J.P. Morgan banking environment. There's there is some need for a central organization that manages your Hadoop instance, that manages the infrastructure, the instrumentation piece of it, and some standardization as to how the instrumentation will happen, right? But then to contextualize that data for a particular business unit, you need people who understand the use cases, understand the narrative that we're trying to drive. So I think there is a need for both, that you need a standards organization, people who are managing your infrastructure are standardizing your instrumentation and the formatting, and then there's that are taking actually the analytics out of it and, and driving you know, what the, the next action is. You know, I do kind of sometimes think about if I you go back to when when IT was emerging, it started out as a support function. I mean, because not everybody understood computers, so you had all your intelligence embedded in the IT organization. But now that we're in the, the world we're in today, I mean, People entering the workplace, they grew up never knowing what it was like not to have a computer, not to have the Internet. So people are actually a lot more technically competent than they were 40 years ago. Um, so, so because of that, I think IT groups have actually shifted their functionality and they're becoming less about about trying to you know, fix the password. I mean, they do do that. But it's it's more less tactical, those kind of things. And, and the IT departments are actually becoming more strategic um, in terms of saying, here's what you can do with technology and here's what you can't do and here's how you do it. I kind of wonder if we look forward maybe 20 years from now, whether we'll start assuming and we'll see everybody has some data analytics capability in every job function. Um, there are some specialists who go way deep, whether this sort of becomes a standard requirement for almost any job, much like knowing how to run a computer is almost a requirement for any job. Hey, you're shaking your head. What does that mean? Yeah. Say on me, sorry. Oh, I would say, were you, were you agreeing or disagreeing? I agree. Yes, I agree. I think that a lot of the work that I was doing in my previous job has been around, um, really around working with the data science team and then the broader trend forecasting team who, who were traditionally more fashion uh, sector experts and product sector experts and consumer sector experts and things like that. And they weren't necessarily data scientists. A lot of the work that the company was doing was really around upskilling everybody to get to a basic level of data literacy, but then also then uh, embedding the data scientists more deeply within the teams so that they would start to have that contextual data so that they could start to have much better conversations. And I think it's really around for a lot of uh, situations, it's really about being able to have 
good, productive conversations with data scientists at the moment. And then obviously, as everybody's base skill level increases, then those would change. But it's really about being able to look at data and ask the right questions of it. And I think that there's a lot of people that, that don't necessarily have that competence yet. And, and we're sort of moving in that direction that you speak of, of around, you know, everyone having that base data literacy. But I think at the moment, it's really just about learning how to ask the right questions of the data. No, when I think also, I mean, you, you know, uh, while I, I think it's it's critical to have all these folks with with the technical skills, you know, I always uh, you can never underestimate you know the ability to just have the smell test because they've actually been out in the real world, they haven't just been behind the screen um, compiling data. They've they've actually physically dealt with people, whether it's you know, trying to get through a payment process or um, or just, you know, fill out an application for an apartment or, you know, and one of the big things for us, which has been really neat as, uh, as we've continued to fine tune our offerings is building the data around what people will actually pay for and, and what they really need because, you know, housing has gotten so expensive and most of the multifamily housing built in America today is for folks making over 140% of median income. And the reality is there's only so many people that make over 140% of median income. And what most developers do is provide 25 different floor plans and uh, every amenity they can think of. So they like get everybody in the door and then they hope they will lease one of them as opposed to compiling the data to figure out, okay, what is it people will pay for and how can we, um, you know, really tailor the offering to that so that we can build you know, more apartments on the same site? Can we build less parking? You know, the big one for us today is parking. You know, we used to build 1.5 parking spaces per unit. Uh, and today we're down to 0.75 parking spaces per bedroom because the trend is these young folks aren't as interested in owning cars. Um, but we're having to change our cycle center offerings and uh, because they are interested in bikes, they are interested in pedestrian options and um, and they do a lot of Uber. And so that's a significant trend that is having a significant impact on the cost of housing. You know, when I, I talked about just in downtown Charlotte, if I were to build a 300 unit apartment community, and park it, it costs me $75 million. If I don't have to park it, it costs me $60 million, and that's $250 less a month in rent, which is pretty significant. And so looking at that trend is, is significant, significant impact on, on housing today. You know, it, it's interesting to, to think about what you said, Clay, because what you're basically saying is if you spend the time doing the data, understanding the data up front, you have to build, you have less models to build. You're more focused in what you're doing. So it's not really that it's um, more expensive to do the data analytics. You're actually saving money by doing different things in different order. Uh, it's significant. I mean, we, we point to right here, five blocks from my home, you know, we are building an apartment community catty corner to a, a good friend of mine who's a developer on um, Max's with last night. But I, did, I didn't rub it into his face that, you know, our apartment community started six months after him. We're actually going to be finished before him and we're delivering it for fifty thousand dollars per unit cheaper than him. Um, but he's building that old 1.5 parking spaces per bedroom and had to go underground. And he's got 25 or 30 different floor plans and lots of offerings. And we will lease up faster because the market will walk in and realize, hey, we have exactly what they're looking for at so, a price point that they can afford. Yeah. Good. So we have a question here from David. Um, the question reads, do you actually feel – that the world is headed in the right direction so that individuals will have data literacy. There are 7.5 billion people, and I personally feel humanity as a whole has declined in rational thinking skills. And even with dashboards and spoon-fed data, individuals may not be more capable of following the data. 
Do you have any reactions? We we'll get lots of smiles. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, I think, I mean, there's a lot of things to unpack in that question. Um, but I mean, obviously, we are in a phase of history where feelings are facts, um, well, at least for a lot of people. And that's how, you know, our decision making is being guided, not by absolute objective truth, not that there is, you know, there's a lot of versions of that these days. And we're moving into this quantum phase of many different kinds of truth. And so and I, these are, I'm, sort of uh, talking about a lot of different trend concepts here, which are probably, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining in a short time, but I think, you know, you do have to be optimistic about human capacity and human ability. And I think, you know, to assume that people just don't care or won't be bothered or just are not capable, I think that's just, you know, we're setting ourselves up for failure if we do that. I think that, you know, when we're forecasting futures, you know, you can look at things from a very apocalyptic view and, and we are in some, you know, potentially in some situations headed in that direction, or you can look at it as an opportunity to put in place different behavioral interventions that will change the path of, of different things. So it's really about, you know, thinking about, yeah, maybe some people don't think rationally, but then what are the interventions that can be put into place that might change that? I think a little bit this is also that how many people really need to understand the future trends and the, and what's we're predicting, right? There's data literacy in terms of what happened. So data tells a story of what actually went on. And then some of the things that we're talking about is we're looking at those macro trends to predict and put a product together in terms of what the next apartment building is going to look like, what the next fashion trend is going to be, or how technology is going to evolve over time, which is not everyone's cup of tea, right? No one, your regular Joe doesn't need to know what how he's going to buy his Starbucks tomorrow. Um, but when if we succeed in putting that trend together, it would be so natural to extend that experience that he has today in a different you know industry or realm and bring it to him in a different one, and he would not even feel that oh, of course, this is the only way I get a cab is through an app now, right? It becomes second nature to us. That 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 ability to take data, take trends, and put a product together that serves a need that the consumer doesn't even know he has a need, right? iPod was not invented because we needed that many songs on a hard drive. It was The problem was that I didn't want to switch my tape back and forth, right? Or I needed a longer tape. So when you do that type of human-centered design, you look at data, come up with a solution. That's not, you know, 7.5 billion people don't need to understand that data. There are a few of us who are working on future that will bring it together. The others, you know, they're, they're users of that data rather than trend setters. Well, and, and I would argue that, you know, we are, you know, we're in a moment of time where it feels difficult. But if you step out, you know, I mean, you know, the China miracle of the last 50 years is, is unprecedented. Um, you have, you know, a billion folks that have truly changed the trajectory of their lives and uh, and even arguably the trajectory of the population growth there. And, um, and just, you know, you can take most any places and look at the 50 year trend and, and feel really, really positive. Um, and it's not necessarily every place. Um, but if you, st if you're stuck in the last two year trend or three year trend, um, it tells a completely, completely different story. And, um, and so, you know, from a long term perspective, I, I, I am bullish on where humanity's headed. I think we have to have, you know, we, we sometimes we, get, we have to have the cold water thrown in our face that we can't take things like democracy for granted. And, um, and I'm hopeful that energizes folks get more engaged as opposed to having the opposite impact. Yeah, that's good. The, the other thing too is, although we say people need to be more literate, um, they're going to, data is going to be more strategic. Um, we saying that is easy. Um, and I, th I think ultimately it is right. The real question is what's the time horizon until we get there? Um, I mean, it took us, 20, 25 years for the internet to evolve 
um, from from basic packet to where it's something that we can use today almost as it's a part of our life it's it, it's a, a requirement almost to live um, but I think maybe maybe another 20 25 years um, maybe we'll be that place with data um, but that doesn't mean that we give up on it it means it's going to be hard to get there and we just have to keep itching away at it um, I, I and I, I'll look at our session today is the fact that we're even having this conversation maybe 20 years ago we wouldn't have had that conversation so maybe this is the way it just has to start is that it has to be painful. Well, and, and I use just my my son as a great example. Um, I, have to, I have to stick with things I know, housing and my kids. But my son um, is studying um, insects in college and uh, and, you know, wants to 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 go into that field. And, you know, it took me a hard time to wrap my head around. Well, what does that mean? What does that do? But, you know, last year we spent five months on a farm during the pandemic and he cataloged virtually every insect within, you know, a mile. And every walk we go on still, even this past weekend, you know, he finds some new insect. And because he has his phone, he has the apps, he can identify what it is, he can catalog it. And you're starting to build this huge amount of data. Uh, you know, I mean, insects, certainly in the southeast where I live, you know, is one of the one of the major issues with, you know, our, our lumber industry and and a lot of these industries, you know, and, and just, um, you know, I think malaria alone is, you know, the, the second largest killer of humans in, in the world um, and or maybe even the largest. And um, and so that this the being able to compile that data is is a significant change for the factory of yeah, and I think it's 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 sort of making sense of data. There's lots of data out there. How do you line it up? How do you know that this is real data, organic data? Because much like you know, pay to play and everything else out there, there's pay to play data and reports and trends that are pre presented just because they want to push a certain product or market out. So having the sense of sort of is this data really meaningful? How was it collected? What's the sample size? Right all those things that you would actually question the data before you start blindly following a headline and saying, you know, everyone's going to be drinking Coke tomorrow. Um, we need, you know, that, that sense that, you know, the sort of question that David asked earlier, that needs to be built in that, you know, not just because it appears on a website, is it true? Yep. So we, we've got about two more minutes. So the, the last thing I'd like to think about, and I don't know if we'll get time, but it, maybe it's just something to think about after the session. Um, normally, we think about trend analysis. We're thinking about doing forecasts, you know, what's going to happen next year, the year after that. Maybe maybe you're thinking about next quarter, one quarter, the next quarter. We're rapidly moving to a place where we have data about what's going on instantaneously. So we could be thinking about or talking about trend analysis not being what do we do six months from now, but what do we do for the next 10 minutes? I mean, do we want to switch the, fab, the, the factory to sort of be producing instead of one soda, the other soda? Let's switch it up because we know this, this change is a dynamic change. So forecasting, even, even the window of what we think of as forecasting, I think is going to change. Definitely. And I think IoT and, and technologies that are coming down the pike with 5G are going to be very interesting, right? Because we might see in, you know, in cities like London where you have congestion based pricing, we're starting to see the number of cars coming towards London could increase the tolls on those roads in within minutes, right? So we're going to see a lot of data that's real time that's going to make real time decisions. And, um, you know, the technology has to evolve to get there. Sorry, I'm eating up too much. No, that's fine. I think also in that as well, it's like there's other things that are happening that will help drive this shift. If you look at things like uh, the shift towards insuring with manufacturing, particularly in the apparel sector, I think those sorts of things will help to drive that sort of fast, rapid decision making forward as well. And I think a great example, I mean, um, 
you know, my, my brother-in-law was a, you know, massive producer of PPE over in China. And next thing you know, the, the Chinese government cut him off of all of his production um, and had to then revamp, you know, all these American factories, which took time. And, and so I think, you know, the, the, the true lesson learned is, is the world changes much quicker today. And so being nimble is critical. And, um, and, and data, you know, if it is that access to help and help and create that, you know, create that roadmap. So they did send me a message that said our time is up, but they said they leave us open as long as we want to keep talking. I see we have a couple people on the channel still. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll express uh, David. David expressed his frustration about people la lacking critical thinking skills. Um, I know one of the things that irks me is when I talk to people and, and they sort of assume that AI is going to swoop in and fix all this stuff that we've been talking about. But everything we've been talking, we're talking about a very human process that sounds like it's not something that AI can directly replace. I kind of wonder what you guys think about how AI plays into what we're doing. Yeah, I, mean, I think AI has been, or at least in a payments world, we've been having AI in neural networks for a long time. We've been looking at certain transactions and the way the transactions and behaviors and predicting if something is fraud or not fraud, right? So if I know that you always fill up gas from a certain gas station and suddenly I see you 200 miles away in, within a 30 minute window, well, that's not possible. That's fraud, right? So AI still needs someone to set up the rules. And then the other problem that we're starting to see more and more with AI is because of the data that we do get, AI is biased, right? Uh, it doesn't because it never saw any other data. So it, it only knows one way of predicting things. So I think it's not the cure all, it's not the world that's gonna end everything. It's how we use that data and how we train AI to make those predictions that's going to be matter a lot in the future. I agree with all of that. I mean, it's just a case of, you know, there are situations where AI is really useful. Like, you know, you look at product recommendations and things like that. There's lots of interesting stuff happening there. If, you know, looky like is and all that sort of stuff, but in the long term, like, I think there is still a lot of the long term stuff doesn't work with AI yet. And I don't see it happening for quite some time. But well, I think it, it reinforces, you know, the, the importance of, um, you know, of a liberal arts education, um, because the reality is, is, you know, there, uh, it's hard to value it until you get away from it and realize, you know, hey, this gives you a lot of different perspective um, and, and opens your mind up to different perspectives. And, and that's, you know, the number one issue we've got in the world today is, is too many people can't appreciate the other's perspective. I think that's a great sentiment to end this session on. Because, I mean, that is, it is really true. You have to understand the sentiment of other people. You have to understand how and why the data was collected so that you understand the shortcomings behind the data. Um, so I think that's a great way to end the session. Um, let me, let me put up, um, our, our contact information here at the end. So anybody wants to reach out and, and, and contact us, hopefully um, you can see that. Um, but feel free to send us emails if you want to continue the conversation or by all means reach out through LinkedIn if you want to as well. Thank you so much for attending. Appreciate it. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of, of the event. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Terry. Appreciate your con. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, Terry. Thanks, everybody. Enjoyed it.